in three and two and one. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Tim Anderson, the appraiser's advocate. We're here with the movers and shakers of the real estate appraisal industry. And today we're here with Mr. John Dingman, the chief appraiser of class valuation. Now, John and I have known each other for many years. We've served together on the National Association of Appraisers. Uh, he's a personal friend. And uh, we're here to cover various questions from a standpoint of what lenders are looking for from appraisers. John, how are you this morning? I'm super great, Tim. Super great. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate it. Now, again, John is the chief appraiser for class valuation, but he is not its spokesman. So we're, John is going to express John's opinions. Uh, and he, uh, if whatever John says, this is John. Uh, it, it's not class valuation. So, uh, John, um, let's get, go ahead and get started. Now, again, you know these things are not scripted, but we have considered what it is we're going to discuss. Let's discuss, first of all, the 1007 form. Now, when it was originally designed, you know, nobody knew what an Airbnb was. Uh, nobody knew what a nightly rental was for a house. So uh, yet it's the only tool out there that appraisers can fill out relative to income, but yet it was never set up to discuss or to disclose, you know, something that rents, okay, maybe it rents for 300 bucks a night, but maybe it only rents 10 nights a month. So given the fact that, you know, you see appraisals before they go to lenders, you know what appraisers are, excuse me, you know what lenders are looking for. What is it lenders are looking for on the 1007 form? And uh, is there another form in design that might be coming out? And how can an appraiser make sense of this so it doesn't look like the appraiser is trying to misrepresent anything to the lender? Man, that's a that's a doozy of, of, of a question. Um, I was uh, just in D.C. at the TAFAC IAC meeting. Um, and I, I am aware that the Appraisal Standards Board is uh, um, looking to uh, write a couple of FAQs on this very topic, uh, which is timely. Uh, additionally, I am participating in an Appraisal Buzz webinar uh, that will uh, take place in July on this topic as well. So in 2018, Tim, the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, who designed the form, by the way, and you're co absolutely correct, like they didn't design it for use of STRs. It wasn't even a thing back then. Um, the, they made the decision to accept the income generated from a short-term rental, an Airbnb, VRBO, you can think of all the other uh, companies that, that participate in this market. Um, they said, well, we'll accept the income from those properties uh, it, for qualification purposes for the loan. Well, at the same time in the guides, they say to demonstrate uh, the income from those properties, you would report that on a 1007. And so you have lenders who are expecting that. They're looking for proof of that income. Now, there are some lenders, DSCR lo uh, lo lending companies, uh, they call them DSCR loans, uh, that have some requirements that are very different. They say we are expecting an appraisal on the property. We're expecting uh, 1007, and they put very specifically in their guidelines that the 1007 should represent long-term leases. Uh, and then they say to the lender, not the appraiser, they're expecting proof of income. It could be tax returns, bank statements, rental rolls, um, and we're even some report from a service like AirDNA. The, the lenders are looking for, and oftentimes the user of the appraisal, so think of it as loan originator, um, maybe underwriting even for that income stream to support what the uh, borrower is stating uh, the income will be. Uh, I mean, the problem again, Tim, is that form was designed for something very different. It's to report leases, which leases are generally defined as occupancy of 30 days or more. Uh, and it is to report an opinion of market rent uh, which the uh, income stream from a short-term rental is not consistent with market rent. There's so much more that goes into that. So I'm not aware of any forms that are going to be released. Um, maybe there's some that should be created. Uh, I am aware of at least one class through the Appraisal Institute today that Jason Ferris out of Kentucky wrote 
uh, called uh, short-term rentals and their impact on residential valuations. And I think if appraisers are gonna pursue uh, this type of activity um, as a practitioner, then they should probably look at that kind of education. Yeah, because right now there's no advice. And um, you get those phone calls, I get those phone calls. And uh, there really isn't much we can tell anybody uh, because uh, again, something may rent for 300 bucks a night, but okay, it rents, you know, five nights a month. And uh, that's not a long-term rental, which is what the form uh, was designed to uh, account for. Now, let's continue on with the form. Now, we are supposed to come up with an opinion of market rent, and then we're supposed to come up with an opinion of basically market expenses. So uh, a VRBO, an Airbnb, a, a spare bedroom you got in your house, how in the world is the poor appraiser going to come up with a market-based summary or a market-based schedule of the, of the expenses uh, that can be charged off solely to that particular room? For example, uh, okay, it, it, it's a room and a house, all right, and the, the taxes are $3,100 a year. You can't put $3,100 on the form because all $3,100 don't go to the, to the room. So right. do you break it up on a bedroom basis? Do you break it up on a square foot basis? I, I mean, it, uh, I, I know the answer to the question, but I'm putting the pressure on you. But uh, how, is the, how is the poor boots on the ground appraiser supposed to answer that? I, look, I, I think in general, it's pretty hard to answer anyways. It's a very complicated problem, right? I mean, you think of all the nuances related to short-term rentals. Um, uh, the rating that a uh, property owner has, are you a super host? Are you a four-star, a three-star? Uh, how does that impact vacancy rates for your property and also the, uh, the rates that you might charge? Um, you're talking about a single room in a house and, and I've never even thought of that. I, I'm just thinking of the entire property. Uh, and then I think of other things related to it, uh, the vacancy rate and understanding the management of that property. What fees and rates should I be charging on a nightly basis? Not only are they seasonal, but they may be event related. I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, but I imagine if she comes to your town, uh, those Airbnbs are going to rent for uh, a pricely sum on a nightly basis, and they're going to be occupied at 100%. And I would venture to say that that would be true in Phoenix in the middle of July when it's 120 degrees, right? And so um, if you're not also, when you're managing these properties, Tim, if you're not understanding uh, how to price appropriately, which means you're actively participating in that market, which by the, by the way, the IRS indicates then that is a business income, right? So a lease, for example, they consider to be passive income, but an STR, a business income. Then you better be hypersensitive and focused on what hotel rates are charging, what your competitors in Airbnb and VB, VRBOs are charging, et cetera, or you're going to lose money or it's going to sit vacant because you're asking for too much. And thank you for that bright, sunshiny, complete answer, John. I appreciate that very much. I don't um, think I answered your question. But. <laughs> there isn't one, John, and we both know that. And, you know, you raised the issue of, of business income. Well, that raises another, that raises two other issues. Um, what are the highest and best use ramifications? And is a, an appraiser who is credentialed residentially qualified to value a business. So yeah, there's some serious, there's some serious unanswered questions about this. And we're all looking to the lenders or the ASB or somebody to come along and answer the question because there is no answer to it in appraisal theory. There, there is no authority appraisers can go to to get an answer. No, and it, you know, look, I mean, you, the, the two things you're talking about, and I think uh, here again, appraisers are, uh, disparate in their views on highest and best use, for example, I'm of the opinion that if you're asking me to appraise the residential property, if it's zoned residential, um, it, that is a use, a special use actually. And, and if all of the properties around it are generally residential uh, in nature, then I feel quite comfortable in appraising the property. Uh, now, if it's going to be used as an STR, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm going to look for other comps that are being used similarly. Um, 
I feel quite comfortable in completing the uh, the 1007 using long-term leases and, and generating the income uh, approach in, in that regard. Um, business income is completely different because as you know, that is, I, I don't have to be a cert res or a cert gen to even do it. In fact, I could be a business valuer, I'm subject to standards, I guess, uh, to a certain extent, but, um, so could you be a cert res and have the chops to do it? Sure. Um, I, I don't know that we all do. I think generally speaking, everybody in the industry is oversimplifying the problem and the math problem. Um, and that is looking at a daily rate as of today and, and multiplying that out. I like that. Uh, we're, we're looking at the problem too simply. Okay. All right, now that we've beaten that horse to death, um, let's go to another horse we can beat to death. All right. Um, recently, I've gotten a lot of phone calls. I know you've gotten a lot of phone calls. And appraisers are getting what I call quality letters or quality slash reconsideration letters from the GSEs. And they're saying, appraiser, we just don't like your appraisal. And therefore, would you please be thoughtful enough to explain to us what you were thinking when you made the conclusions you were make you made and get back to us quickly now here's the thing uh when things were busy nobody got these letters now that things have slowed down appraisers are getting these letters so if we don't count the slowdown why is it now all that terribly important for lenders to have this extra information when it wasn't important before. Yeah, Tim, I look, I'm speaking, I'm, you know, again, we've already said this, it's my own opinion. And I'm, I'm yes, yes, yes. What I believe anecdotally, right? So I, at class valuation, I've, I've been fortunate enough, very large uh, volume and, and, and uh, large footprint across the country. So I see things on a much larger scale. And I'm, I'm aware that when somebody approaches me or the company about how we treat a particular assignment or whatever, that that's uh, specific to them and that we're operating on a much larger scale. So I do believe appraisers were receiving letters, just probably not to the same scale that we are seeing today. And so to your point, um, volume where it is, maybe that allows for more time and focus on, on these but I also think it's related to market changes and advancements that they're making within, uh, within UCDP and delivery of the reports through the portals and analyzing that data. I mean, you and I know, and I think appraisers in general understand uh, the uh, importance of recognizing market conditions and should we be adjusting for those market conditions in whatever direction they need to go in. Um, but we also heard, you and I did, and every appraiser that was attending the conferences last fall, uh, that the GSEs are, are now paying closer attention to appraisers making market condition adjustments or not making them. Uh, and so maybe it's because that's a new data point that they're, they're focused on. I'm, I can't speak for them, but... Um, and if the market's changing, I think that uh, we probably see more uh, loans that are not performing. And so there's concerns around those. And, uh, and of course, we as appraisers, we get the question from the user of the appraisal, right? I, I, have, to, I have to turn my mic on. Okay, all right. Um, you were recently certified to appraise high-end houses, right? Well, I obtained a certification through McKissick, which is uh -huh. for luxury homes. And, uh -huh. uh, and so, yes, I mean, it's just, I, I could do it anyways with my certified residential uh, right. Right. credential, right. but um, the, the coursework was quite rewarding, yes. Okay, so you, you went above and beyond. Okay, now, Given the fact that high-end houses can be so difficult because of lack of comps, not only lack of sales comps, lack of listing comps, lack of cost comps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and dare I say it, lack of rental comps, uh, in, in those type of properties, are the GSEs going to cut appraisers any more slack 
than they would say for your basic cookie cutter house, you know, 1200 square foot cookie cutter house in a cookie cutter neighborhood, or are appraisers taking on those difficult and time consuming assignments going to be subject to the same, how should we call it oversight uh, as every other appraiser? Well, I don't know if they're all going to the GSEs, Tim, uh, it, depending on their loan amount, right? Um, they could be. Um, I believe the, the exceptional homes, the luxury homes, if that's what we want to call them, um, I think that there's additional scrutiny paid by the credit risk departments at the lenders and, and so on. Um, they are more complicated appraisals. And so if you're an appraiser that are, that are tackling those, you should be aware of that. But I, I think that's oversimplifying the problem as well, Tim, because you and I both know a two bedroom, one bath home uh, it, at a much lower value may be as difficult and complex of a property to appraise as well, depending on the market and so on. I mean, the answer is it depends, but I think every time we put our signature to an appraisal report, Tim, we should understand that there could be heightened scrutiny on the work that we perform. And if we're telling the story, the right story, I say that often, um, and then the reader should draw the same conclusions that we did, and there will be less attention paid to it. Okay, let me go. Ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. You know, look, if you're if 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 the reader of the report doesn't understand how you got from A to Z, even if Z is right, then there's there's going to be questions. Okay, let's let's examine that uh, a little further. Okay, um, in following up to the question uh, of, of greater scrutiny and reading what is in the letters that the uh, GSEs are sending to appraisers, I think it's, it's safe to say that the GSEs are asking for uh, better formed and better written appraisals. Now, you talked about telling the story. Okay, now. Um, I have come across my desk lots of appraisals every year, and I read lots of state uh, appraisal board decisions every year. And one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, appraisers are generally not trained writers. You know, some of them are, but that's just that's just ancillary. But you know, you go back to appraisal school. You know, how many hours did you spend in appraisal school learning how to write reports? None. Um, how many CE uh, classes are there? on writing reports. I'm not talking about filling out forms. I'm talking about the actual prose, the actual composition of written thought, none. So as a result of why, 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 why do the GSEs feel that they can hold us to a standard for which we're not trained? Tim, I don't know. And again, I don't want to speak for the GSEs. I, I, I'm just going to take this from the perspective of a reader, and, and I am one, and, and as a chief appraiser, and I am one. And when I'm looking at your appraisal report as an appraiser and you deliver it, if the consumer, the user, the lender, whoever it is, has questions or concerns, how did you get to, from A to Z? I'd like to pick up the appraisal report and without communicating with you, tell them how you got from A to Z. I should know. Um, when I don't know, that's when I'm reaching back out to an appraiser. When I talk to appraisers, there's this uh, overarching theme that somehow they have to be overly verbose in the appraisal report. And that's not, that's not what's being asked of them. Um, what is being asked is that the data is consistent, uh, that their messaging is consistent, and that they've put it in plain terms. I don't, I don't know that you have to be a scholar and use really big words. Uh, in these appraisal reports. But look, if you are uh, presenting, for example, at the top of page two, 100 sales from 50,000 to 5 million, I'm pretty sure they're not comparable, which is what the section is asking for. And then as a reader, whatever your opinion of value is, let's say it's at the lower range and you've got all these houses that you're uh, you have included in the grid from let's call it 100 to 150,000. The reader of the report's trying to ask, well, what happened to the houses at 200 or 400 or 700 or a million or more? Why are we not like those? Um, if you're going to use disparate sales that are less proximate 
um, they're different than the subject property with regards to their relevant property characteristics, then I would expect to see a number like zero or one at the top of page two. And that, that would be telling the right story. I only had one comparable sale to the subject property that is included as comp number one. Uh, and because the of these differences in the market in the property, I went further away or further back in time and that's why comps number two and three are uh, are presented in their form. All right, let's let's examine that. And I, I I love the example of you know what's on top of page two. So the appraiser puts her hundred sales last year, and what the appraiser really meant to say there were a hundred sales, but only seven of them were comparable. Okay, now that appraiser isn't telling the story. That appraiser is telling another story. It's got nothing to do with the value of the house. Now, uh, so the, the appraiser isn't really trying to mislead anybody. That, that's not the point. The appraiser just made a mistake. So, and uh, of, this, of the seven sales that actually were comparable, the, uh, the appraiser determined that two of them were divorces. So we're not going to use those sales. So there are only five comparable sales. Now, a lot of appraisers are gun shy because they say, oh, if I don't have a whole bunch of sales and a whole bunch of listings, the, the, the GSE is gonna get back with me. The lender is gonna get back with me. The AMC is gonna get back with me. But that's just not true, is it? No, again, I mean, it's quite the opposite. I'm approaching appraisers when, when again, I, using that same example, let's just call it 500,000. I might be asking the same question about why do you not have what what is selling at a million dollars just like I might be saying what is selling at a hundred thousand dollars I don't I don't understand the value um, and how you got there again you might be right but I don't understand and if you had just told me that there's only five sales again what did Fannie and Freddie say when they created the the form and even the 1004 MC Tim and that is remove anomalies so that sale between brothers uh, that was at the 50,000 that's removed and the house that's over improved that that doesn't really even belong in that market maybe uh, that sold for 5 million that's removed. Now we have houses that are between let's call it uh, 200 and 800,000 because we remove those two anomalies. And then I think if you research the market, you'll find out that you have one, two, three or more tiers. And I went through this exercise with an appraiser just a week ago, and I called the agent involved in at least one of the transactions. And they said, oh, it's very simple. If you look at houses, I didn't even ask specifically about prices. I asked about the sale of the property they were involved in the transaction, right? They said, oh, it's very simple. You're either looking at a, an investor flip, so a house that has been uh, remodeled or updated, and those prices are over this amount. And if they haven't been, then they're less than this amount. Well, that's a two-tier market. Nobody's asking the appraiser, by the way, to search for comps based on price. I think you search for anything that could be a comparable. And once you've identified that you're in a specific tier, that's your comparable, that's your, uh, your micro market, your sub market, then that's what you would report on the top of page two. And in the market condition section of the report or the market conditions addendum, if that's what you're presenting. So what you're saying is part of telling the story, uh, part of painting the overall picture is you've got to pick up the phone and you've got to call the broker, the buyer, the seller, somebody, and you've got to verify the transaction, not only to determine if it was arm length, et cetera, but then to find out more about that market, because yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe it sold for a million dollars, but it sold for a million dollars simply because somebody thought that they could, you know, put $50,000 into it and then sell it for a million five. Whereas a more typical uh, market value in the neighborhood would be $800,000. So you wouldn't look at that $1 million sale as a comp simply because you went to the time and the trouble, in other words, the due diligence. In other words, you complied with standard one dash one, standard rule one dash one. Uh, I had to sneak in the use PAP reference. I'm sorry, John, it's just in my DNA. Um, you, you went to the due diligence to find out what was going on so you could tell your client the story. 
And basically what you're saying is when this letter comes in, the client is mad. The client says, I'm confused. I don't understand. Please, here's a, here's a chance for a do over. Please explain to me what it is I don't understand about this so I can understand it as well as you do. That's basically what's happening, right? Yeah, I, you know, and, and hopefully you have that story. Maybe it's in your work file and you just haven't expressed it in the appraisal report and, and we move on. I think we've all heard stories at, at conferences over the last decade where it's, hey, I picked up the phone, talked to the appraiser. They said, no, you don't understand. This is what's happening in the market and very succinctly tell you. Uh, and you go, man, if that was in your report, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Um, and so think about that. The reader of the report doesn't have to be an appraiser. They don't have to be necessarily a sophisticated user of appraisal services. They just need to understand what it is that you wrote. Um, and, and I think more often than not, appraisers would find uh, less questions and concerns from all of the parties that are reading the report if that were, that, that were occurring. Okay, so if, if the appraiser were to tell a better story, if the appraiser were to make you know, a, a legitimate beginning, a legitimate middle, and a legitimate end, so there, so that the conclusion flowed from the beginning in the middle, then there would be fewer letters coming out from Fannie Mae, from lenders, from AMCs, there'd be fewer phone calls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. 100%. I mean, like I said, Tim, I, the for me, if, if it's raised to a chief appraiser at one of our lender partners and they're calling me about an appraisal, I, for that matter, anybody at our lender partners, if I can open that report without ever going back to the appraiser, I've, I've solved the problem. There's less friction with the appraiser. There's less friction with the lender partner. Uh, the, the concerns are addressed. So if I can just point them in the direction where they can find the answers to what they're looking for, then that is an awesome outcome. Okay. If I'm struggling on the phone with my lender partner, then I'm going to have to reach out to the appraiser and ask the same question. Okay. And then chances are, as you just indicated, uh, the appraiser is going to answer the question and you're going to respond, hey, that's great. Why didn't you put that in the report in the first place? And which would have saved everybody a whole lot of trouble. Okay. Let's, um, we're, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, let's transition into something that's near and dear to my heart. And that is what's happening now and its impact on the future. Now, um, there is a big movement to put more appraisers into appraising. Oh, okay, fine. But things have slowed down from what they were 18 months ago. And you, you talk to one person and they say, oh yeah, things are gonna get better and builders are gonna start building again and interest rates are gonna stop go, go, going up and, and uh, the, the Fed, everybody on the Fed is gonna realize that they can't keep raising interest rates. And, and therefore, yes, things are slow, but now's a great time to get into the business because within two years, things are gonna be picking up. And then there are those, and I must confess, I, can, I count myself among this number, that are saying it may be a tad iffy. Um, you know, F Fannie Mae, the GSEs are not going to stop ordering appraisals, but they're probably going to be ordering few of them, fewer of them. And which means appraisers might have to transition into uh, non-GSE work, what I call private work. So from a standpoint, obviously you work with lenders all over the country, you work with appraisers all over the country. Uh, you know the people at Fannie, you know the people at Freddie, and um, from uh, you were just at the TAFAC meetings, uh, so everybody knows TAFAC is the Appraisal Foundation Advisory Council, okay, and you were at the uh, Arello meetings, which is, a, what what is it, American, what what the hell is Arello? I, I was not at Arello meetings, but oh, that, were, that's related to educators, yes. Okay, all right, you were, okay, my bad, okay, so you get to talk to all these people. What's your take on what's happening? Well, it's no secret. Most people know my daughter is a trainee, Tim. So I'm bullish on appraisers and appraisals. Um, 
I know that when a lender submits their loan application to the GSE specifically, that uh, option number one given to them is a traditional appraisal that requires the appraiser's personal inspection, a 1004 for all practical purposes that we know, know and use today. Um, I know even when presented with alternative solutions that uh, the real estate agents involved in a purchase transaction or the consumer may opt to say, that's great, but I want a traditional appraisal. I think there's always a home for the appraiser. Um, I think we're uniquely qualified to, uh, to uh, opine on the, the value of real property. It's what our credential is designed for. Um, and in some states, we're the only ones privileged to do that. And so um, I look for opportunities to serve our clients, Tim. And I think if we do that and we do that well, regardless of who the client is, um, then we'll continue to remain relevant uh, in our space. But if we want to continue to challenge and push back, then I think users of appraisal services find alternatives. And that doesn't serve us well. And I, I thought about that this morning before we jumped on. I had uh, dinner the other night at a Thai restaurant with some friends. They said, Dingman, you're being difficult with the waitress. Well, that's because I, I love Penang curry, but I like the vegetables that they use in the red curry. So I always say I want uh, Penang curry chicken with the red curry vegetables, right? And I will tell you, Tim, I've been to Thai restaurants before that won't accommodate that request. Like, no, you can either have the Penang curry or the red curry. Guess where I don't eat again? I don't eat at the Thai restaurants that refuse to serve me what I want, what I'm asking for. Um, I don't know what the reason or rationale is, but it is what it is. Uh, and, and I think for, in, or at least in some instances, the clients know what they want. Um, and I think we just need to figure out a way to deliver what they want compliantly and ethically within the confines of our standards and, and rule and law. Okay. Um, John, I, one more question, if I may, please. Yeah. Do, do you see um, coming in the future appraisers being able to use uh, restricted appraisal reports more frequently than they can now? Or do you feel that things are going to, the, the status quo is going to continue. And I, I know the GSEs are, are changing the reporting form. That, that, that's a done deal. It, we just don't have the final version yet. But I'm talking about, uh, do you think appraisers are going to come on board and for reports that don't have to go to the GSEs, they're going to go to the uh, restricted appraisal report, meaning uh, the, it's not going to take him any less time to do the appraisal, but they're going to get the report out a whole lot faster. Do you see that coming down the pike? I, I mean, I think investors behave differently, uh, Tim. So some respond uh, to the changes that the GSEs make, regardless of the fact that they're sending it in that direction. Um, and then I think others make independent decisions that are best for them. I, I do think there are restricted appraisal reports that are out there that appraisers may not necessarily be performing. Uh, we know that their desktop appraisals very different than the desktops that are defined by the GSEs and their set respective selling guides last March, but desktops for portfolio loans and HELOCs and things of that nature. Um, and there's opportunities there, but I, you know, I think very much like Brian Reynolds does in this regard, and we talked about it at the onset, talking about uh, narrative report writing skills. I think there's an opportunity when somebody engages you in the assignment. So they're establishing that relationship with you. Um, there's some opportunities to ask questions and then deliver them the report that they're expecting. I used to use a narrative report writing tool for residential. People might find that surprising. I even used a, a, a narrative appraisal review um, uh, template uh, for, for that purpose. And so if you're not expecting a form, um, cool, I've got a solution for you. And if you don't want all of these other ancillary uh, addendums, things like a location map, because you're the homeowner, you know how to get to your house, right? Um, maybe you don't want a floor plan. Maybe you don't want photos because you know what your house looks like. All of those things. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to listen to what you want and then deliver what it is that, uh, that you need 
uh, and again, within the confines of the standards and ensuring ethics uh, are, are in play and competency and all that other good stuff. John, thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your wisdom and I appreciate your advice. If uh, someone wanted to get in touch with you, uh, how would they do that? I'm pretty easy for folks to reach. Uh, they can certainly email me at jdengeman at classvaluation.com. Um, but appraisers uh, and, and others seem to find me on LinkedIn and Facebook and message me there. I don't pay as close attention to those. So um, if you do, be patient. Uh, but I'm generally really responsive. I think most of the uh, folks that know me and communicate with me know that I will. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, John, again, I appreciate it. Uh, please let me express uh, my best to you, uh, your family, and uh, you'll, uh, uh, are you going to be at the uh, Appraisal Expo or the Appraisal Summit? I'm going to be at both the Valuation Expo. I've been asked to speak there, um, so I'm joining a, a, a great group of speakers uh, on market conditions, and then uh, I will definitely be at the Appraisal Summit uh, later on in the fall. Excellent. All right. Look forward to seeing you there. Well, John, thank you. I appreciate your time, your advice, and your uh, efforts. And uh, the uh, we'll, we'll be in touch because I'm sure there are going to be some more questions. So my best, John. Thanks. Bye -bye. Awesome. Thank you, Tim.